Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our discussion today on product solutions for a stressed food service supply chain. Uh, today's session is going to be recorded, and you can find it both in your email following today's session and on the Buyer's Edge platform website. I'm currently sharing a QR code here on my screen. If you want to scan that with your phone, it'll take you directly to the Buyer's Edge platform website um, and it's actually our support center site that will show up and this site is designed to give you the latest news tips insights videos recommendations around food service supply chain so whether you're looking for the recording of today's session or not i highly recommend that you take a look at this um, our team is working with our partners like those in the call today to just make sure we're constantly giving you the most up-to-date information out there so check that out um, now, I'm going to introduce to you the other folks that are here with me, um, but before I do that, I want to say please jump all over the chat box here or the question screen in your GoToWebinar window. You know this, but COVID has obviously disrupted supply chains around the world, um, and we are continuing to navigate those, and we have this great group here today to talk to you and answer questions and share insights. So take advantage of that and please put your questions there for us. We can make this as engaging as possible for you to get even a tiny little nugget to take away with you. So um, let me introduce to you who's joining me here. We have Amanda Rumba from Georgia Pacific, of course, Georgia Pacific, an industry leader in washroom and food service disposables, focusing on adding value and reliable, hygienic, and innovative solutions. Amanda is responsible for driving the growth and customer satisfaction through competitive programs and market relevant product solutions. And we've got Julie Cavey from Edward Don and Company, and Julie has been in the district distribution, excuse me, side of things for her entire career. So we'll get to have her incredible knowledge and insight on today's conversation. Um, we have Kareem Kayali from Georgia, I'm sorry, General Mills, um, 22 years of experience in supply chain with the emphasis on logistics, um, so around supply, branding, planning, warehouse, transportation, customer operations, so brilliant resource for us today um, and you can't see him but his voice is certainly here we have gene trotta from restaurant connections bringing the culinary angle to the table um gene is the ceo of restaurant connections which is a food service staff and robotics solution company and also has 35 years as an executive chef so um now that you know everyone that is here to share their knowledge with us uh again don't forget to ask, ask questions don't be shy but to get the ball rolling here um so of course supply chain and labor issues continue to be big hurdles um for 2022 uh amanda why is this? I'll let you kick us off. Can you share some insight based on your business experience of what continues to go on and holistically when things may even out? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to try my best to answer this question. I feel like if I had a crystal ball, I probably wouldn't be here right now. Um, but I'm going to answer these in kind of three different ways. So first, touching on um, labor, supply issues, or excuse me, supply chain. And then lastly, what GP is doing to mitigate some of these issues, because unfortunately, it's some of it's out of our control, but what we're doing to try and make the best of it. So in regards to labor, obviously on the manufacturing side and being from Green Bay, Wisconsin, I see a lot of different issues when it comes to getting and retaining labor on the manufacturing space. But what I can tell you in regards to manufacturing, manufacturers are becoming very creative in how they're procuring um, their employees by changing their benefits, making them you know, more robust, increasing salaries. I see signs all over about increased salaries and just changing the culture so they become more um, wanted to for the employees. So what I'll tell you too, also when it comes to manufacturing, not only has it been difficult to actually get the employees, but also the onboarding process. And I know talking to some of the other manufacturers on this call, they you know can say the same as that 
even when you get those employees, you still have to wait for that onboarding process, which can take months because of the complexity of running the machines, whether it be toilet paper or food products for general mills. And then after that, becoming actually efficient on those machines. So there's definitely, you know, a learning curve when it comes to labor and manufacturing. What I'll tell you is that, you know, at least from the GP side, we're seeing you know more labor coming into our facilities which is going to increase obviously our efficiencies in our mills and i do see and foresee the same you know for other manufacturers too the second piece is supply chain so supply chain there is issues all the way from the beginning stages all the way through you know getting to food service operators and one of the interesting stats that I saw um, it was a couple of weeks ago coming out of 2021 is that we ended the year with, not we, so the US ended the year 80,000 drivers short or 30% of where we needed to be to be able to deliver um, every single order um, out in the marketplace. So there's a significant um, disparity in where we need to be and where we are when it comes to the truck driver shortages. So that was that kind of blew my mind. I knew we were short, but how short? Um, but you know, again, what GP is doing to help be proactive is you know working with distribution partners like Edward Don on making sure that we're optimizing orders. So instead of ordering you know a couple times a week, how can you order? once a week or every other week to make sure that you know we can ship in full truckloads versus multiple small orders to kind kind of help you know with the shortage in labor on the supply chain side um, so yeah definitely trying to be proactive um, is where what we're doing for things that we can't control so um, I'll turn it over to the rest of the group but that's what GP is doing what I've currently seen um, over the last couple of years in um, supply chain and labor that's awesome. Thank you for that insight. Julie, I'd love to hear your perspective on there, especially with regard to kind of optimizing those orders. Um, but before you do talk, I just want to draw everyone's attention really quick in the handout section. There's a fabulous um, take home there that Edward Don provided. It gives you kind of an overview of everything going on in the supply chain, what to expect, and even some ideas. So please take a look at that. Uh, so Julie, over to you. So I wanted to touch on basically what Amanda said about like the labor as well. So um, there are more costs. So she's talking about 80,000 people um, short in the trucking industry alone. So which is kind of scary if you think about it, because the thing is now as manufacturers do manage to like get the labor coming on board, they get them trained, they get them on board, they have the product. Now the product is just sitting on their docks. They can't get it out because they can't find a reliable trucking company who has it, the staff or the, pro, um, the ability to come pick up those truckloads. So as a distribution, like we're supposed to get in a truck, let's say we order on Monday, we get it the following Wednesday or whatever it is. We're not seeing those trucks show up on Wednesday because those trucks are not able to get here because there is no truck to bring them. So it's, we're running out of stock because we try to like time our inventory. So we've had to increase our safety stock because the inventory is just not there when they go to order. So it might be in later in that week, but if you like to order in the beginning of the week because you need product for the weekend, it is causing some issues and some um, problems. So and that's a major concern. The also the concern is with transportation is now you have these 80,000 shortage. They're trying to pay more money to get these folks to come in. Therefore, transportation costs are increasing as well because now you're paying people more to do the same job they were doing in 2019. So we're seeing pricing increase as well. Um, the thing, the one big thing we're seeing in our industry too is the next day airs. We're that is a gamble these days. We're not trusting our our transportation companies or partners, even UPS and FedEx, that they're able to get those products the next day. So um, one of my big things that I say being in distribution is you have to plan because with the shortage of products and then the lead times that come with the manufacturing and then you throw in the transportation delays, if you're not planning out and you're not focused on what you need to do a couple months down the, the road and you're living for the moment, it's going to be, you're going to be out of stock quite a bit. So we're looking to do that. Um, we are seeing some some products um, coming back into stock quicker and manufacturers being able to get those products. But a lot of it is because, um, and I think Amanda can also speak to this as well, is through some consolidation of their lines. Before maybe there was 4,000 lines that they were like um, items that they were able to produce. Now they're only probably maybe down to like 2,000. 
Um, a good example is like souffle cups. A couple of manufacturers are not doing those tiny one ounce ones or the huge five ounce ones because the two and a half and the three ounce ones are the more popular. So as opposed to taking the time down to change the lines out, which could be a day or two, and getting them back running again, they're just letting them run those two ounce portion cups as much as they can, or those PET cups, which have become incredibly hard to find. So we're seeing a lot of that happening as well. Um, the, what else was I gonna say? Oh, and equipment too. Like if you're looking for equipment right now, the lead times, I think they, we were looking at our preferred supplier list anywhere from 10 weeks on. So like the lowest lead time that we're showing is 10 weeks. So again, you have 10 weeks, they have this, they make the product, it's now sitting, trying to get transferred over somewhere and we're waiting another two weeks sometimes to get those products in. So it's a big thing with planning and the timing that the, those, those delays are being caused by this. So. You, Kareem, is there anything else you would like to add on that from a little bit more of the food perspective? Yeah, I, I think everything Amanda and Julie touched on, I would reinforce um, 100%. I think that they've got um, their fingers on a pulse and, and it's consistent with what we're experiencing at General Mills. I, I think as Amanda touched on, Labor availability was was the, the predominant issue early in the pandemic, and just getting jobs filled was Herculean. Um, as we've seen, fill rate both for skilled labor and, and unskilled labor, you know, more of the temporary type um, activities, both of those fill rates have improved um, within our network, within um, external partners. Um, but the, the next challenge is you might have individuals on, on paper that uh, satisfy your requirements and a prerequisite to, to operate. But with the pandemic continually coming in with waves and, and variants like Omicron, which we're all battling right now, um, sometimes the availability isn't there. Even though on paper you have it, you're still reacting to availability and shortage issues that um, continue to, to you know, hamper us and our ability to be predictable. I think Julie's spot on with how we how we evaluate our portfolio as a mechanism to combat um, some of the challenges we have. So temporary suspensions on items that maybe are more niche within a portfolio. So if you look at a biscuit line, and we've got um, multiple SKUs that historically are offered by General Mills. We might focus on the core, the classic 80-20 rule where 80% of your volume is 20% of your, your product line. And, and that's not to, you know, cut cost per se that's really a, a play for availability to make sure that we aren't doing those changeovers that julie touched on and and reducing the complexity as you have a variety of products and, and a maximized assortment of a, of a platform that requires unique ingredients that you need packaging all the things that um, labor is is manifesting itself in in being disruptive you know we 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 characterize it as labor, it sounds so simplistic, but it could be a vendor issue and getting packaging to a facility we're operating. It could be a warehouse issue downstream after product is made, and getting it out the door and, and being down 40% of their staff. And that constraint shows up all throughout the supply chain. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is make sure that we're as um, focused on core products as possible to maximize availability and get it out there in the marketplace and then return to the the variety and the differentiation that we offer long term once we see some stability. That makes sense. Um, yeah, and I mean, this all makes a lot of sense. And hopefully, for everybody listening, it's solidifying kind of our understanding of what is causing some of these um, issues. But then, in terms of those delivery fill rates and actually getting product in the hands, Amanda, what kind of proactive steps could an operator take to prevent some of their shortages that are direct? that are impacting their guest experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a couple different things, you know, I kind of noted. And, you know, the first one is going back to what Julie said, especially for distribution is, you know, you as operators, making sure you're very transparent with your distribution partners on what your needs are and making sure that you're forecasting appropriately and getting that over to distribution in a timely manner and making sure that you're, you know, leaving that cushion. Um, I know that's easier said than done, um, but the more you can do that, the more it's going to give companies like Edward Don, you know, the time to be able to turn around and place an order uh, with their manufacturers and suppliers to get that product in your hands. Um, the second piece of it, you know, just from a, a GP perspective, and I kind of touched on this, is, you know, working on um, open communication with distribution. 
uh, one of the things that we've seen as issues, and, and Julie touched on it a bit, but I kind of want to reiterate the importance is truck drivers not being able to get to the you know distribution centers, even if it leaves our docks, they may not get to distribution in a timely manner due to various reasons. If they have to go through multiple hubs, then the driver from that hub to the next one, um, if you're doing like LTL orders, if they're late. So it can really become a snowball effect. So GP is coming out with different technologies on real um, time data where distribution can actually go and track their orders that, okay, our driver is in Chicago, Illinois, and, you know, on this corner, basically, I mean, it, it comes, it's actually pretty detailed, and distribution can see that and say, okay, well, is this going to meet our appointment time? If not, um, you know, do we need to adjust so they can bring in another truck during our appointment that we should have, you know, met? So, you know, GP is just really trying to be proactive in, you know, making sure that, you know, delivery fill rates are, you know, are more positive um, versus going the other direction. And then, you know, the last thing kind of touching on all of this and going, I'm probably, probably jumping a little bit forward, but talking about product solutions is start looking for product solutions that are high capacity where, um, for example, we offer different towel, tissue, cutlery systems where they're extremely high capacity. So you're not going to have to change out um, the refills as often. Um, it's controlled, so you shouldn't be going through as many refills um, as you would with maybe some bulk items. And then the last piece of it is, you know, the product comes in small cube. So you may be able to keep two cases of a particular refill in your storage versus maybe, you know, one um, refill um, previously. So kind of looking at different efficiencies like that on being able to kind of make sure that you have enough product in your um, in your storage versus waiting till the last minute to place additional orders. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Karine, what is General Mills doing to work through some of these shortages on products and labor that would um, be helpful for a food service operator to really understand? For us, uh, you know, we, we really need to be, where can you control um, some of the disruption? And, and that that's easier said than done. I, I think we're very much reacting to things that are occurring and, and it seems like every week there's a new surprise uh, awaiting us where we have to come up with a solution. But there are instances where there is a little bit more predictability on the constraint. So if if starch shortage, which is real, it's in, in the market in, ter in terms of starch availability, we've got to lean on R&D and our food science to, to come up with formulations that uh, will, will place less demand on products that are difficult to come by or we anticipate uh, seeing constraints in, in the market for an extended period of time. Uh, simplicity and simplifying our, our products is important. You know, there are times where we might have complexity engineered with positive intent around a, a bespoke formulation for General Mills on an ingredient or 10 versions of vanilla with the most positive intent. But when you have disruption and a supplier that is providing that and it's a highly unique ingredient has challenges, you're, you're riding the wave with their disruption and, and you're down and out accordingly. So having some more universal specs or greater qualification of alternate supply in the market will help us navigate when we have disruption from from one particular source that is unanticipated that we can make a pivot in relatively short order and stay on stay on the game uh, you know we talk labor obviously that's near and dear to all of our hearts and and it's 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 affecting our operators it's affecting everyone as we've already discussed today but what I'd say is we, we can't take our, our eyes off the end game and maybe the mid and long term strategy. So that automation in, in terms of where we can take some labor out of our manufacturing environment continues to be looked at. If you're operating a, a large scale mixer in a plant or a mixer in back of house for an operator, you, you still need that labor. And if there's an opportunity to make that automated and take some of that complexity out, we're pursuing that and we're pursuing it in venues that maybe are not common or, or immediately the thought in in this fiscal year or this calendar year for General Mills we've got uh, two warehouses that are coming online for us here uh, one in the spring and one in the summer that are fully automated when it comes to the activities that are very uh, labor intensive in a facility if you have an operator that's grabbing a pallet and driving off in a million square foot facility 
and then grabbing a pallet uh, at a different location and driving back to the docks. That's the highly inefficient activity in a warehouse. If that's fully automated and you keep operators and, and the traditional labor on the docks adding the most value, we feel like our, our network is gonna be highly reliable, a lot more predictable, and that's the kind of end solution that we wanna pursue and not just be fixated on the, the near-term issue and have that myopic view on just labor alone. Awesome, thank you. Um, Julie, is there something that Edward Dawn is doing that you think is helpful for the food service operators to know and understand? I think, hang on, Julie, we're having a hard time hearing you. Sorry about that, I muted. Um, no, but um, for us, like we're, with distribution, I'm kind of glad I'm hearing about the manufacturing side, I'm glad I'm in distribution. But what we try to do, we may not have that one item that's in stock, but we do, we might have other suppliers that are in stock with our warehouses that we're able to provide. Um, and some of the other things that we're doing too is uh, we're starting with new partnerships, for any new manufacturers who do have the demand or who have some bandwidth for us to get some of these, some of the, especially the commodity product more so than anything. Um, and then to help out like some of the trucking instances, we have our own truck fleets for, for each of our distribution centers. So we're able to use those trucks to backhaul back from manufacturers to get product back in our warehouses where we are seeing issues or just to kind of get some of those um, shipments off their docks. So we do have product when, when needed or especially in like any dire out of stock situations. So working really hard to try to coordinate that a little bit better with how we have our own supplies. Um, but when it comes to like, you know, automation and stuff like that, with us being a distribution, it's kind of, you know, boxes in, boxes out, but it's just to find what products that we have in stock to help the operators. So um, one of the things is like using our sales force, they're all available as well to help find things that are, you know, different, but it's really just trying to find new partnerships um, and new ways to try to find products that can help because it's, you may want one item, but that may not be available until April or March. And if that's not going to work for you, to try to find something else that is available. And it's it's kind of you count some of those games or what do you have in stock? I need 400 dozen. What do you have in stock? So that's kind of the games that we're playing too, trying to find product as well. So again, that, that planning that Amanda talked about, and I always go back to. Uh, we asked like if we do an opening order for somebody, we used to ask for like four to six weeks. At this point in time, we're asking people to plan out 10 to 12 weeks for an opening order for us to get all the products in and consolidate it and also be able to find those substitutions um, in the market somewhere in the, also in the, in the uh, manufacturer community to be able to fill those orders. So having more time to get those approved, it's, it's really um, changed so much than how we do things. So it's just really, and always to come back to more time and more planning which is not the easiest thing for us to do right now because we yeah. have limited, we're limited staff. And so you're doing more jobs than you used to do um, than you did a couple years ago. And I don't know if anybody's really doing the same job they were doing in 2019. So um, I'm not, I'm just kidding. But really <laughs> not. Um, Jean, from your experience as a chef, what can a food service operator do to handle some of these out of stock products and substitutions. What is your advice for the other operators on the call so they can kind of hear both sides of this? Well, what you're seeing is, are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. What you're seeing is that, you know, floating menus. Um, the menus we used to stick with for long term um, really have to be flexible. Um, you know, our vendors don't have the product as you're hearing from the manufacturers. So you really have to keep your ear to the ground constantly to see what's available. And can you use that product in many different ways? Um, the days of chefs getting these odd products and all different things that were very hard to find have to be shelved at this point. I think chefs have to be more realistic. Operators have to look at their menus constantly. Um, I've gone in restaurants where they're out of 10 items out of 20. Um, it's not acceptable. But in this new world we're all in, in which you know Julie said, we're all doing different jobs that we've never done before. I think the realism is, is that staffing patterns might not come back to whatever they were before. Um, we have to be smart and efficient. Um, we have to work with our vendors and our, and our producers of products to make sure whatever we have is on hand and our customers are going to be happier for that. Um, you, know, uh, you know, we do staffing, so 
We remember when cooks were $14 an hour, now a cook is $21 an hour. That happened in less than a year. Um, we can't keep on pushing that to the consumer. So, you know, everybody's looking at different ways of saving and we really have to be smart about the products we use and make sure they're available. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, going back a little bit to labor, um, that's obviously becoming harder to find in all of these aspects of jobs um, that we're trying to be really efficient. What sort of products and solutions might you suggest for an operator to help offset some of those labor gaps? Amanda, you touched on it a little bit, but was there anything else you wanted to add around what other considerations? Yeah, absolutely. So like in addition to what I already touched on, it's just, again, making sure that the products that you're bringing in, you know, are labor efficient, whether it be paper and resin products from Georgia Pacific or, you know, food products from General Mills. Um, it's extremely important in this environment. Um, some of the things and in, in product solutions that we have um, are one, what I already mentioned, high capacity. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, you know, when you have high capacity, you know, uh, towel, tissue, cutlery, um, napkin dispensers, your labor is not having to take as many breaks from, you know, talking with your customers and making sure they have a premium experience. Um, having to go out to refill dispensers, you know, every 30 minutes, they have high capacity solutions that, you know, they can rely on. Um, and we offer a wide variety of those. And um, as long as Jillian's okay with it, I'd be happy to send, you know, some of those um, product solutions out there that I'm talking about. Um, a really good example too on labor efficiency is our newest smart stock cutlery um, dispensing systems. Um, there's two different versions that I'm talking about. We have a tri-tower and then we also have a wrapped cutlery for uh, takeout and to-go. But what's really uh, cool about those and makes them even more labor efficient is they have what we call kind of fuel gauges. Um, and it, it's red, yellow, and green on the front of the dispenser. And it shows how much cutlery is left in that dispenser. So it's really easy as um, you know an employee taking an order um, or a chef taking a quick peek across the room to see, okay, am I good through a uh, rush hour? Can we wait to refill the dispenser for another 30 minutes or do we need to go and make sure we refill them now so we don't disrupt the patron experience? Uh, so really easy to kind of just take a peek without having to really stop what you're doing to go and check on a dispenser because it can be really difficult having to go every 15 minutes. Okay, do I need to go refill? Um, now or later um, and then you know the last piece of it is just the ease of refilling the dispensers as well um, i kind of joke a lot when i talk to clients that usually it takes more time for an employee to go to the storage closet and get the refills than it does to actually refill our dispensers and that's from cutlery to towels to tissue um, it's super easy it's quick and then again, with the high capacity, they're not having to go back and change it out um, frequently. So just thinking ahead um, on how you can change maybe the, the systems that you have in place to become more labor efficient. So your employees really are making or doing other things within your operations to make sure your customers have an amazing experience and want to come back versus, you know, sitting there, you know, stuffing towels in a, in a, you know, a, a towel dispenser that's constantly running out. So um, those are my suggestions that I have from GP. Awesome, thank you. Um, Kareem, I'd love to hear some solutions from General Mills. I, I would say our solutions um, and our innovation has to be tied to solutions, um, in particular what our operators need and that's ever evolving. And I think it's predicated on where an operator is in the continuum of, of their particular um, outfit, if you will. So if you're, a, for instance, let's take baking. If you're a from scratch baker, you know, General Mills's value to you might be, we have all Trump's flour, which is probably one of the most consistent flours you could find on the market. You take a highly inconsistent raw material and commodity and wheat and you turn it into something that is highly consistent. That helps the back of house operation, particularly your labor, um, when you're dealing with a consistent product and not reacting to variance and, and variability within it. 
that that operation may have a challenge now and say, I want to go to kind of a, a, a baking mix solution. And we have that as well. So you go from scratch, you go to baking mix. That's that's a solution to take some of the back of the house labor demands and, and minimize those a little bit. Somebody that's on mixes might say, I, I'm, I'm ready to make the jump to frozen baked good and unbaked frozen where uh, we could replicate for the most part a lot of the the uh, the finished product, the, the toy product offering that you see using Scratch or or mixes, but having something that's even more user friendly to try to um, support what an operator is interested in or, or their particular challenge that they're managing through. That's even evolving now that that requires some conditioning and prep, even though it's um, um, from the freezer, we're, we're investing in freezer to oven technology. That's more on demand, real time when you're ready to um, make something when labor is available or if you're reacting to unpredictable demand in an operation of, of when products will need to be consumed, you have something that is a relatively quick turnaround time. All the way to we're investing in thaw and surf, right? And all of all of these options come at different price points. They come um, ultimately all that we believe to be very high quality and can replicate uh, different iterations of, of the baking solutions that I've taken you through. But it's really important for us to be intimate with the operators first and foremost. That's that's what we do. Uh, that's our whole business model. It's not just pumping out volume. It is understanding what operators need in partnership with our distributors and direct uh, communication and collaboration so that we know where we need to innovate to, to provide those kinds of solutions. Uh, the, the other things I throw out there, I just use baking as an example, but everywhere from schools and K through 12, we continue to have two OEG offerings. We have the most diverse portfolio where a school district can provide the nutritional benefit to a student with one serving. And it's a cup of cereal and it's simple, it's easy, and it has all the high nutritional benefit that we need to deliver in that school environment. Uh, yogurts and parfait pros, uh, not scooping out of a tub and having a way to, to um, distribute into the cups a yogurt in a very easy foolproof manner uh it comes with granola in a kit and all the things that we can do to take out some of the labor and thought from the process and still deliver a high quality product awesome thank you so many solutions and that's definitely helpful for um the variety of needs out there um on the breath of innovation gene i'd love to hear a little bit from you about what Restaurant Connections is offering as some of the solutions to offset labor gaps. Yeah, so we started out as um, a headhunting consulting company. And, um, and, and as COVID hit, we went into the robotics business. Um, we found that uh, robotics will not replace people, but work in concert with the employees. So as we talk about, you know, things that maybe are, you know, they can, be doing different things. We have a Dusty that mops and sweeps the floor. Um, all autonomous, does everything on its own, uh, works around people, sees, goes around people, very safe automation. Um, we have our maitre d' line that delivers food to tables. Um, and we have, you know, a Richie, which actually goes up and down elevators. All these different designs that we have really um, help people, work with people. When we put them into place, um, you know, we have uh, in our wait staff and stuff really embrace it because they're not running back and forth. Now, you know, labor is, is short. So how do we make it easier for the people that are coming to work and are producing, um, make their job easier? And, and that's where really robotics comes in. Um, we even have cooking robotics where we have an ACE, which stirs the food for you, turns off and also dumps that food out into pans. Um, the technology just keeps on moving forward. And as we install these products, it's really interesting to watch people, even in an older generation, we just did an install in a diner where two older women just, you know, they said, listen, my back hurts, my arms are not what they used to be. This robot has saved my position, actually. It's running back and forth for me. It's doing the work. It's interacting with, 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 the, uh, with the customer, which is fun. Um, we have uh, restaurants where people are coming in to see the robots, um, and, and, you know, and it's 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 a fun thing to see because I think we have a solution to a very big problem, and you know, and that's great to be part of that. Um, 
And and again, it's I don't want to come off as we're replacing people because that's not what our goal is. It's really to help these restaurateurs get through this and have a long-term solution. This is not just for COVID. I think we've seen staffing drop since around 2015. We started to see it drop. COVID has accelerated this this whole issue, but these jobs that people just don't want or they have so many other options, these robots fill the void. And you know, and that's that's it's been a lot of fun to figure this out and and see people accept this and see what and, and so much more is to come. That's very cool. Definitely a solution for everyone here in terms of how to fill those gaps. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, this question is sort of for all of you. We have so many food service operators listening in on today, just itching to understand more and more of what they can do to get those customers what they promise to be serving them. Um, what is sort of one thing that you each can sort of share, one little nugget or tip that you want all of the operators to take with them today um, for how they can best communicate and work with their partners to get what they need? Um, Amanda, I'll start with you on yeah, absolutely. There's so many things, you know, that that came out of this call. It's hard to, you know, pick just one. Um, but if I had to pick one, it's just, you know, look ahead and be proactive. I know that's easier said than done, but the more we can all do that, the better off that we're going to be. So just looking ahead and and looking at value added systems, whether it be, you know, a cutlery dispenser, a, you know, a bath tissue dispenser or something that, you know, Kareem, Kareem mentioned from General Mills, just, you know, slowly kind of maybe replace some of the things you're doing today to get you to the point where you want to be and be more efficient. Awesome. Thank you. Jean, how about you? You know, I think it's, it's looking at your recipes, looking at your production. Um, making sure you can do it with the staff you have and, and, and don't be afraid to change that menu. Um, I think you're going to have to work. Everybody's suffering here. And I think we all have to work together with our vendors and our, and, and our manufacturers to make sure our customers get what they need. And I think it can be done, but it's just going to be different. I think we have to adapt. So, thank you. Julie? Yeah, Jean basically said what I was going to say. It's like looking at your menu, reviewing it. Is it the items that are high labor, are they profitable? If not, maybe there's some times that may, it may have to come up the menu for a little while until you can have that labor. But also, I mean, I, I keep saying it, but planning out ahead, making sure that you know, you're looking at your equipment. Is it starting to fail? Is it starting to do something wrong? Um, keep an eye on that. So you might need a part. Uh, parts are, you know, long lead times. So just knowing that. But really just looking at your menu and knowing what your labor is going to be for that menu and how you're going to make money because if you're you're shooting out um if it's a signature item but it is so high labor it may not be worth having on the menu for now for a limited time or you do it as a special like once a week or something where people can still get it but not have to worry about having it every single night so i mean just like looking at new ways to not take away because i know if i go to my favorite restaurant and my favorite dish is gone I get a little, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm bummed out. But you know what, people are, are understanding what's going on right now. And I think it's just the real world that we live in, but making sure what you're doing is keeping that profitability and making you money as you, because it's right now, that's what the focus needs to be. Thank you, Kareem. I'll preface this with, uh, it was negative 18 in Minneapolis this morning. So it might have uh, affected my train of thought a little bit, but. I want to just compel maybe on the emotional side a little bit and just say, you know, the, the key takeaways are not alone. I, I think we're all fatigued. We're all frustrated. There's been a relentless adversity that we've faced uh, and it doesn't feel like it's going to let up anytime soon. And, and it's hard. Um, there's some wins and there's many losses on this journey. And, and um, but what that means is we're all in the same boat. And when you have, as Gene mentioned, just articulating back to uh, distributors or to, to manufacturers what you need, there's empathy, there's understanding, and a desire to make that connection and, and make that solution a reality for our operators. Um, if it was an isolated issue in just one area, it's just trucking, you know, it, it, we wouldn't have the same uh, camaraderie around the, the difficulties that we're all facing. And, and my, my thing is just be resilient, uh, be communicative, and let's partner together to get through this and, and see an end uh, to all of this. 
So true. Thank you. And I appreciate that. I think everyone probably does that ultimately from no matter what side of the food service angle you're coming from, um, everyone's got the same goal. So having that empathy is definitely a huge way to get some ease in the pain. Um, I did get a couple of questions come through. The first one being from for Jean, actually. Um, Jean, given your experience in the industry, what are some new ways that you've learned to work with your partners and do you think that these ways are going to last forever or we'll go back to ways that things once were well i don't think we're ever going to go back to things the way they were i think staffing is always going to be a challenge from this point on um i think you really have to work with your vendor and your vendor has to work with the manufacturer and i think if everybody's working together i think it's more important what is available rather than give me a list of what's not available. Um, because what the manufacturer is making or has a surplus of, that's what we should be working with. Um, and in and, and just, you know, the blame game is over. Um, I think, you know, again, working together is really the only way we're gonna get through this. And and I think it's just, just it's gonna look different. It's not, it's not that it's gonna be bad. It's just gonna be a different way of doing things. And, and that's okay. I think we have to accept that. Change is hard. Um, this next question, um, very similar, but on the manufacturer side, are there products that you think are just gonna sort of be gone forever that your company or, or organization is looking to kind of retire out of this, or is it too soon to tell? When an example was um, with General Mills, that vanilla example that there used to be 10 and maybe now you're looking at one. Is that something that you think will continue in the direction of simplifying what we're creating. I I don't for me I think it's just being smarter around how we provide variety. Uh, it's not going to be a path where we're going to start rationalizing a bunch of SKUs in my opinion where we won't see them again. Um, I think demand speaks and and if there's demand for products, you know, the solutions will be there for us to to pursue and ultimately make sure that uh, we can support and satisfy that demand. So, you know, are there unique one-off items that um, we temporarily suspended? Operators chose something that is more popular in lieu of it, and that stuck, and that demand doesn't come back. Certainly, that could be uh, an outcome. But by and large, we still want to be uh, an entity on our end that can differentiate in the marketplace, have products that resonate with operators and the end users. And we won't necessarily be looking to deliberately, you know, shelve items or take some complexity out just because it's it's expensive or it has temporary implications to how we cycle products and the amount of product we can make available in the marketplace. We believe that we'll we'll sort those those constraints out, and we still want to make sure we have the right solutions and the right product offerings in the market. Awesome, thank you. Um, believe it or not, that is actually the last question that I have for you guys and from the audience as well. Um, but I do want to thank you all for joining us today and thank you for listening and um, asking the questions that you did. These challenges can be exhausting, as Kareem said, for everyone. And I hope that you found today helpful in hearing just a few perspectives of what's going on and what you may consider doing to support your operations through the remainder of the supply chain struggles. And again, check out our supply chain support center for news and updates and all things relating to this topic. And if you'd like to talk to an actual person, um, schedule a meeting with us, just scan that QR code and we are here for you. These are our partners that you're looking at on this call also. So we're all trying to help come up with the best solutions to get everyone what they need. Um, and again, as Kareem said, you are not alone in this. Um, but thank you everyone. And that is all we've got for today. Have a great afternoon. Thanks all. Thank you.